and then we hope it's quiet. And it is quiet. Perfect. Welcome. Welcome all. Welcome to Pakka is de Zwijger and welcome to the 20th edition of housing. In Dutch it's called huisvesting. You only need to know that because if you want to tweet about it and then you have to use the hashtag huisvesting, otherwise it's housing. Uh, in English it's housing of course. This series housing is uh, developed in um, collaboration together with the Amsterdam Federation of Housing Corporations. And this edition today about community living projects is developed uh, in collaboration together with residents, uh, with uh, Fares, where are you at? Fares, raise your hand here. Uh, David, sitting next to him, and uh, Adrian. Adrian unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, but we will be ho hearing more from Fares and David later on in the program as well. Um, yeah, so tonight we're going to talk about community living projects. There's th uh, that are projects. Uh, the first that was started is started in 2016. It's called uh, Startblok Riekerhaven, and it housed more than 500 people. Half of them were status holders, newcomers here to the Netherlands, and half of them were young Dutch people living together. The main goal of such a project is to uh, stimulate integration. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Many projects have followed after Riekerhaven, and uh, we're going to evaluate these projects tonight. Not really evaluate, but more talk about how do they work? What is it like living there? And does it really contribute to integration? And what is integration? How can we grasp what integration is, and how can we perfectionize or improve these so sort of projects uh, to make to stimulate integration even more. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, but first, before we begin, I would like to ask and look what the audience is. Wh who's here? So let's start with who here lives in a community living project. Please raise your hand. Oh, quite a few people. That's good. We really want to hear what you have to say about these projects as well. Who here works for a housing corporation? Please raise your hand. Quite a few as well. Who here works for the municipality of Amsterdam? Ah, welcome, welcome. We had a speaker of the, of, uh, the municipality of Amsterdam, but unfortunately he couldn't make it last minute, so uh, we don't have a replacement. So if you, you want to add something from the perspective of the municipality, please do, because we're missing that in the program tonight. Um, and who here uh, personally has nothing to do with community living programs, but is just very interested in the subject and wants to learn about that? Raise your hand. Yay! Welcome you too, because we, of course, we want other people to learn about these projects as well, and not only have the in crowd here in uh, in the room. This is also uh, a program that is live streamed right now, so there are also people watching at home. And that's why we all need to use the microphones. For everybody who wants to say something, we're going to use the microphones so that people uh, back at home can hear us as well. Um, so tonight we will discuss the perspectives of the residents themselves, of the housing corporations, and we'll try to put the perspective of the municipality in here as well. Uh, but first off, the first speaker we we're having is, um, he is a manager at The Key, uh, and he's manager real estate and development. <laughs> what are you laughing? Oh, The Key, sorry, yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> that, was the, that was the English uh, uh, pronunciation, sorry. He's manager at The Key, um, and he's going to give us the perspective of, of the housing corporation itself. He the, the guy actually was the developer of the first community living uh, project, and he's going to talk about how did they come to, to make this project, what makes it special, the, the why, the how. Uh, please give him a hand of uh, an applause. His name is Rink Postuma. Thank you well. Ik heb afgesproken dat ik vandaag in het Nederlands praat. Ik ben geloof ik de enige die dat doet in het Nederlands. Uh, maar dat is een beetje uh, gekomen omdat ik hier bij toeval eigenlijk sta. Want eigenlijk zou hier een collega van mij zijn uh, die uh, nu de laatste tijd heel nauw betrokken is bij, uh, de, uh, bij de, de startblokken die wij uh, hebben vanuit de kei. Uh, ik was dat in het uh, verleden uh, heel nauw betrokken. Uh, maar zij kwam vanavond niet. Uh, ook zij kon vanavond niet. Ze had iets uh, privés heel belangrijks vandaag te doen. Uh, dus ik heb een invalbeurt. En uh, ik gebruik ook haar sheets. En daarom vind ik het ook prettig om eventjes in het uh, Nederlands te praten. En ik heb ook wel begrepen, volgens mij, dat er 
Uh, heel veel mensen ook wel Nederlands verstaan. We zijn met heel veel Nederlanders volgens mij ook bij elkaar. En ook uh, natuurlijk een aantal statushouders. Uh, dus ik sta hier een beetje met toeval. En zo is eigenlijk Startbok Riekenhaven eigenlijk ook begonnen. Ook een beetje met toeval. Um, uh, eigenlijk de, een samenloop van omstandigheden. Want Startbok Riekenhaven, dat zijn eigenlijk de oude uh, woningen, de wooncontainers die wij hadden, of modulaire woningen uit de houthavens. Die op een gegeven moment na 15 jaar exploitatie in de houthavens ook daadwerkelijk moesten uh, vertrekken omdat daar een nieuwe woonwijk kwam. En die woningen waren beschikbaar. En um, uh, die konden eigenlijk nog wel een tijdje mee. En dat was nou precies op het moment, en dat, daar zit in zekere zin dan de toeval in, dat ook de vluchtelingencrisis uh, uitbrak en de gemeente Amsterdam uh, naastig op zoek was naar huisvesting voor, uh, voor statushouders. Want de gemeente had daar nog een hele grote opgave in te, te doen. Um, dus wij zochten naar een plek voor uh, onze beschikbare wooncontainers om ze nog een aantal jaren door te exploiteren. En de gemeente had een huisvestingsvraag en die kwamen bij elkaar. En zo is er een uh, samenwerking ontstaan tussen de gemeente Amsterdam en huisvesting, uh, of, uh, woningcorporatie De Kei. En later is daar Socius Wonen bijgekomen. Um, en toen dat, uh, is er een locatie gevonden, die was op uh, het voormalige sportpark Riekerhaven. En toen uh, is daar natuurlijk met uh, Achmed Badoet over gesproken, de voorzitter van het stadsdeel uh, Nieuw-West. En die zei van ja, om nou 560 uh, statushouders bij elkaar op één plek te zetten, dat vind ik eigenlijk niet zo'n goed idee. En uh, laat nou de helft statushouder zijn en de andere helft uh, Nederlanders. Uh, dus daar was eigenlijk het uh, concept om mee ontstaan om de helft uh, Nederlanders en de helft statushouders bij elkaar te brengen. Um, nou, moeten jullie verder weten dat, en dat is ook misschien wel weer toeval, de KEI een, uh, een, een koers had bepaald in die jaren, waarin we hebben gezegd, nou we gaan vooral voor uh, woonstarters, voor jonge mensen, gaan wij woningen beschikbaar stellen. Nou, vanuit dat perspectief is ontstaan um, dat wij jonge Nederlanders gaan combineren met jonge statushouders. Zo is eigenlijk dat idee van Stadpolkrieke Haven, die menging van jonge mensen uit het buitenland, vluchtelingen, en jonge Nederlanders, dat we dat gaan combineren. Dat is toch een beetje een andere aanloop dan, uh, zeg maar net gezegd, we beginnen met een, vanuit een perspectief om een woonconcept te, te introduceren, wat bedoeld is om de integratie te bevorderen. Nee, eigenlijk was het perspectief voor ons een huisvestingsperspectief. En dat moest een leefbaar huisvestingsperspectief uh, zijn. Nou, dat was best lastig. Ik werd in de zomer van uh, 2015 dan werd ik, uh, gevraagd, om dat te gaan doen voor, uh, voor de kei. En we zijn natuurlijk naastig op zoek gegaan. Van, goh, waar hebben we nou zulke soort voorbeelden? In de stad? Nou, die waren er eigenlijk niet. In Nederland? Dat was er eigenlijk ook niet. Uh, in Europa dan? Was er eigenlijk ook niet. Toen zijn we op, eigenlijk op een gegeven moment uh, gaan na, zelf gaan nadenken. Ja, hoe zouden we dat dan uh, willen vormgeven? En toen is eigenlijk het idee ontstaan van, nou, uh, om nou een... Uh, we hadden allerlei paviljoens. Die moesten we eigenlijk vanuit de houthavens overzetten naar Riekenhaven, om daar nou één paviljoen voor de Syriërs te maken, en dan weer een paviljoen voor de Nederlandse studenten, en dan weer een ander paviljoen voor Nederlandse werkenden, en dan weer voor mensen uit Eritrea. Dat is eigenlijk niet zo'n goed idee. Dus laten we nou maar all the way gaan. We gaan het complex gaan we maximaal mixen. En zo is uiteindelijk bedacht om een... een ja, om dat project op die manier uit te rollen. En, uh, en toen hadden we ook al bedacht, van, ja, dat kan mogelijkerwijs ook een bijdrage leveren aan de integratie van, uh, van jonge statushouders in de Nederlandse samenleving. Dat kan een bijdrage leveren. Maar het, is dus niet, het project is dus niet opgezet vanuit het perspectief, we gaan eventjes vanuit de huisvesting een uh, enorme bijdrage leveren aan de integratie. Dat is eigenlijk de bijvangst voor ons en, en niet zeg maar, het, uh, het hoofddoel. We wilden wel een fijne plek maken voor iedereen. Uh, maar later is pas eigenlijk dat uh, idee van de integratie meer en meer op de voorgrond gekomen bij de verdere uitontwikkeling van het uh, project. Even kijken, ik heb Fleur nog meer opgeschreven. Uh, ja. Ja, uh, bij de uitontwikkeling van het project hebben we op een gegeven moment bedacht, er moet een soort van concept onder liggen. Dus we hebben een manifest gemaakt en dat is eigenlijk op het moment in het project dat er uh, um, 
dat er eigenlijk toch wel het idee van die, uh, van die integratie, dat dat zeg maar meer en meer op de voorgrond is uh, gekomen. Dus toen is het woord community ook eigenlijk in de ontwikkeling betrokken. Uh, he, dat, dat zie je ook in het uh, samenwonen in de community met allemaal jonge mensen met verschillende achtergronden. En hetzelfde doel, een goede start in Amsterdam. Dat was het eerste punt in ons manifest. En dat je dan een beetje op elkaar past en dat je dan een netwerk vormt en dat je elkaar dan inspireert. Dat zijn dan zeg maar eigenlijk, was dat toen werd dat toen de, de, de intellectuele en misschien ook wel de, uh, ja, de drager onder het uh, concept. En uiteindelijk moet het dan zo zijn dat na vijf jaar, hè, want iedereen kreeg een jongere contract uh, voor vijf jaar, dat je dan na vijf jaar zo, uh, zo ver was dat je elders in de stad of daarbuiten een, een andere plek zou vinden en dat je dan je leven daar kon vervolgen. En dan staat er nog bij het vijfde punt, rechtsboven, dat we het uh, terrein dan ook in, in gezamenlijkheid gaan beheren. En wij dachten, van, het is niet voldoende om uh, mensen alleen maar bij elkaar te zetten, ze moeten ook in gezamenlijkheid iets doen. En dat heeft dan te maken met het beheer. Want je kunt er wel één beheerder op zetten, maar ja, uh, die kan natuurlijk nooit 560 mensen een beetje in de gaten houden. En we hadden echt geen idee van wat er zou gaan gebeuren. Of dat, een beetje, of dat helemaal uit de hand zou lopen, of dat het heel makkelijk zou gaan. Uh, daar hadden we eigenlijk helemaal geen, geen beeld van, want er waren geen voorbeelden. En toen hebben we bedacht, van, ja, dan is het goed dat er mensen zijn in het, die divers door het blok wonen, die dan een, uh, daar ook een beetje daarin kunnen sturen, en waardoor we in ieder geval snel signalen krijgen uh, uh, als er dingen misgaan of dingen goed gaan. Dus we moeten vormen van zelfbeheer gaan introduceren. En zo op die manier hebben we uiteindelijk in een organisatievorm gekozen. En daar hebben we socius wonen bij betrokken, want die hadden daar ervaring mee. Dat had de kei helemaal niet. De, inmiddels doen we dat wel. Renato zit hier in de zaal. Die, die, is nu, zeg maar, hè, die doet nu de aansturing van het zelf hier op Elshagen. Maar dat had de kei helemaal niet. En daar hebben we de socius wonen voor uh, ingeschakeld. En uiteindelijk hadden we zeg maar, in een organisatie ongeveer 60, 65 mensen betrokken die in het complex woonden. En die ook informatie naar boven en naar voren haalde. En allerlei activiteiten en, uh, en taken die normaal gesproken de kei deed, uh, die, uh, die gingen zij doen. En daarmee hadden ze dus een taak, ook in het, in het project. En dat bevorderde ook de communicatie onderling. Althans, dat was de gedachte. Nou, hier is ongeveer de organisatiestructuur. En dat zijn de eerste mensen die in dat zelfbeheerteam uh, zaten. Uh, ik denk dat er inmiddels in al deze mensen, of ze woonden er niet meer... Uh, of ze zijn inmiddels weer vervangen door anderen. Dus dat is ook een soort van vlottende groep. Um, uh, maar wij hadden het idee van ja, dat, uh, dat, gaat, uh, dat gaat vast werken. En dat bleek volgens mij in de praktijk ook wel. Nou, we hadden dus één projectcoördinator. Die was, er staat hier nog die van de kei. Dat is inmiddels ook zo. Maar die was in eerste instantie ingevuld door uh, de socius. Uh, en daar waren een aantal projectmakers. Die zaten meer op de leefbaarheidskant. Uh, en daar waren dan weer gangmakers per gang. We hadden iets van... Uh, 26 uh, gangen met uh, nou, ongeveer 25 uh, woningen per gang. Nou, per, per gang waren er, waren er twee gangmakers, één statushouder en één Nederlander. En er was ook een uh, terreinteam die hield het terrein dan op orde. Um, dan waren er mensen die, hè, dat was Fleur, die hier vanavond zou zijn, die deed de communicatie. Dat deed ze overigens fantastisch, want ze werd overal gevraagd in de landen om, er, om de spreekbeurt te houden. En niet alleen in Nederland, maar ook... Uh, uh, verderop in, in Europa, maar op een gegeven moment ging, uh, start ook Rieke, Rieke Gaven, ging ja, een soort van viraal. Hè. Dus ze hebben echt overal op, op zeepkisten en podia gestaan, congressen toegesproken in, uh, in Nederland, maar ook dus verder buiten. Nou, ook zelfs het, uh, het huur, uh, de huuradministratie wordt door, uh, door uh, beheerders van, of bewoners van de startblok gedaan. Allemaal tegen betaling overigens. Ze, ze krijgen allemaal daarvoor een uh, tegenprestatie. Soms in een, 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 zeg maar een korting op de huur en soms ook echt een, gewoon een, een loon. Nou, dan werd er was ook een technisch beheerder met een klusteam en die, ook die raakte betrokken bij Startblok Rijkhaven. Dus dit is eigenlijk de hele zelfbeheerkant van de Startblok. De Kei heeft dat nooit gedaan, vanaf Startblok Rijkhaven wel. En dat passen nu ook wel in meer reguliere projecten, passen dat nu ook meer en meer toe. Nou, belangrijker misschien nog wel dan dat zelfbeheer, was voor ons het, uh, het, ja, het idee van de zelforganisatie. Dat mensen onderling, bewoners, onderling allerlei activiteiten gingen organiseren. Sifaris hier in de, in de zaal zit, voor een uh, stichting actief van, uh, van Rieke Haven. En die organiseren nou, ongeveer 65 uh, bijeenkomsten, vorig jaar alleen al, allerlei verschillende activiteiten. Waardoor zeg maar, uh, 
Mensen met elkaar in contact konden komen. Er werden feesten georganiseerd, filmavonden. Nou, ik heb natuurlijk een, wel een paar meegemaakt. Maar lang niet alles natuurlijk. Uh, op een gegeven moment raakte ik ook weer een beetje op afstand. En dat is ook goed. Maar dat deden de bewoners zelf. Dat is eigenlijk veel beter nog, of belangrijk misschien nog wel, dan uh, zelf het beheer. Nou, wat zijn dan de basisingrediënten? Voor nou misschien nog één ding nog gaan toevoegen. Um, we hebben de jonge Nederlanders ook geselecteerd op basis van motivatie. Um, dus eigenlijk niet zeggen van nou, je bent woningzoekend, uh, ben je dan ge maar nee, je bent je ook geïnteresseerd in dat, ja, in dat community living uh, concept wat we hebben verzonnen. Uh, wil je daar eigenlijk wel wonen? Of sta je bij toeval bovenaan de lijst en wil je om die reden wil je dan uh, daarvoor in, uh, in aanmerking komen voor uh, Stakbroekrieke Haven? Dus we hebben uiteindelijk op motivatie uiteindelijk mensen ook geselecteerd. En eigenlijk hebben ze zichzelf geselecteerd, want ze moesten gewoon eerst zich inschrijven. Moesten ze nog een uh, enquête invullen met de motivatie. En uh, er kwamen natuurlijk allerlei voorlichtingsmomenten. En als je er geen belangstelling van, uh, voor had, en je kwam uiteindelijk wel ingeschreven, maar je kwam niet, dan viel je gewoon af. Dus op die manier selecteerde je jezelf eigenlijk. Nou, en uh, op die manier kregen we dus ook wel een gemotiveerde groep ne jonge Nederlanders. Uh, te samen met uh, jonge statushouders. We hebben ook nog een heel introductieprogramma gedaan. Misschien wel een beetje achteraf gezien wel te veel. Hè. Drie introductiedagen. De hele dag georganiseerd. Heel spannend. Vooral ook voor ons. Uh, van goh, hoe gaat dat dan? Uh, dat is natuurlijk ook de eerste keer dat je zoiets doet. Allemaal prima verlopen. Maar misschien had het ook wel wat sneller en wat praktischer gekund. Volgens mij hebben we het Elzagen ook wel wat uh, in kortere tijd gedaan. Nou, wat zijn dan de basisdingen voor, uh, voor een community is dat er een platform ontstaat, digitaal, dus dat je elkaar ook kunt vinden, dat er communicatie in de participatie op orde is en dat je een gezamenlijk doel hebt. Uh, misschien kan dat nog wel wat sterker. Uh, we hebben net het manifest gezien uh, en ik denk dat daarmee ook wel het gezamenlijke doel ook wel geformuleerd is. Ja, en dan moet je het uiteindelijk ook met elkaar moet je het ook wel echt gaan doen. Hè? Dus uh, wij kunnen het wel verzinnen, achter het bureau, dat hebben we ook gedaan. Maar uiteindelijk moet je, uh, en dat hebben we ook wel een beetje getest, hebben we de, destijds ook een klankbordgroep ingericht en gevraagd van, goh, is dit, zijn dit de goede ideeën? Nou, het waren gewoon jonge mensen, ook met uh, statushouders erbij. Nou, een beetje gespiegeld, maar uiteindelijk moet je het gewoon in de praktijk doen. Dus wij kunnen het wel verzinnen, maar de, de mensen die op die startblokken wonen, ja, die moeten uiteindelijk, of moeten, die kunnen in, uh, uiteindelijk die, uh, die integratie op gang brengen en die kunnen ervoor zorgen dat het een fijn complex is. Nou, we hadden natuurlijk ook een aantal partners, de gemeente Amsterdam al genoemd. Ik denk heel belangrijk in deze is uh, uh, Stichting Vluchtelingenwerk. Die hebben wij uh, voor de eerste keer, zo heb ik het in ieder geval begrepen, uh, op locatie gehaald. Er waren uh, 260 uh, of 280 uh, statushouders bij elkaar. En het was voor hen ook een aanleiding om op locatie een vestiging te openen. En uh, dat, maakte de, ja, dat, dat was natuurlijk wel heel praktisch. Want als er een hulpvraag was, kon je direct eventjes bij uh, vluchtelingenwerk langslopen. Uh, later is de stichting uh, Icayello, of hoe heet het? Ja, ik kan die naam niet zo goed uitspreken eigenlijk, merk ik. Maar die zijn er ook, met name voor de Syrische statushouders, hebben die een belangrijke rol gespeeld. Om, uh, om hen... Eritrees, wat zei ik? Ja, Eritrees. Ja, sorry, dat bedoelde ik eigenlijk ook. Uh, <laughs> uh, de Eritrese zeg maar, statushouders die toch een wat grotere afstand hebben tot de Nederlandse samenleving, om die, uh, om die zeg maar, op, weg, uh, op, op weg te helpen. Nou, er zijn heel veel mensen die uh, wilden langskomen bij uh, Stadbroekriekenhaven. Eindeloos veel studenten die erop afgestudeerd zijn, ik denk wel een stuk of 15, 20 of zo, die uh, uh, nog steeds. Uh, fantastisch. Uh, niet alleen uit Nederland, ook daar weer uh, zelfs mensen uit Zuid-Korea die uh, kwamen naar Stadblok Rikkehaven dat onderzoeken. Dat vonden wij allemaal natuurlijk heel bijzonder. Um, um, maar ook later van de TU Delft is er, is er een uh, uh, nou, is onderzoek gedaan. En daar hebben een uh, KWH uh, Eye Openers Award gewonnen. En die hebben als, uh, als beloning zeg maar, voor het winnen van die prijs hebben ze ook uh, onderzoek uitgevoerd. En eigenlijk kwamen daar best wel gunstige uh, resultaten uit dat onderzoek. Want wij wilden natuurlijk weten, werkt het nou of werkt het nou niet? En uh, nou ja, dus, uh, in, op basis van dat onderzoek van de TU Delft blijkt er inderdaad wel degelijk allerlei duurzame contacten te ontstaan tussen de verschillende bewonersgroepen en ook onderling. En het feit dat uh, 
dat de Syrische groep natuurlijk ook bij elkaar groep uh, uh, ja, bonding heeft, maakt uh, niet dat ze vervolgens niet ook nog contact hebben met allerlei uh, mensen uit Nederland. En dat zagen wij natuurlijk ook zelf gebeuren uh, in het startblok uh, met al die activiteiten en de, de vriendschappen die er werden gesloten. En eigenlijk uh, uh, is dat in het, in het onderzoek van beide onderzoeken we kwamen best wel gunstig uh, de resultaten ook ten aanzien van de leefbaarheid. Dat die eigenlijk niet slechter was dan uh, of beter of in ieder geval een soort van gemiddeld was dan uh, ook vergeleken met andere bijvoorbeeld studentencomplexen. Ik heb nog één minuut. Nou, dat is niet veel. Um, nou, gaat alles dan goed? Nou, ja, natuurlijk, uh, het is natuurlijk een project voor tien jaar. En uh, het is net als een krant. De eerste krant maken is niet zo moeilijk. Dus de eerste dag op het startblok is niet zo lastig. Maar het uh, blijft dan project ook lopen en goed draaien zeg maar, over een periode van tien jaar. Dat is best nog een, een, heel, uh, dat is een hele pittige uitdaging. En daar hoort natuurlijk steeds bij dat ook dat team ver, ververs moet worden. En dat, uh, dat die onderlinge contacten iedereen gaat, die duurt uiteindelijk ook weer zijn weegs. Uh, dat is uh, best wel ook een, een pittige opgave. En er zijn natuurlijk ook allerlei uh, mentale en uh, vraagstukken van de vluchtelingen. Er zijn natuurlijk taalbarrières en culturele uh, verschillen. Er zijn financiële uitdagingen voor mensen. Het zijn ook maar jonge mensen. En niet iedereen heeft altijd uh, direct een, uh, uh, nou ja, of, of goede financiële basis. En uiteindelijk zullen we straks ook mee gaan maken na vijf jaar. Ja, dan wordt het nog best lastig als om, voor iedereen om een nieuwe plek te vinden. Nou heb ik nog één slide volgens mij. Uh, de gemeente Amsterdam vond uh, Stadblok Riekenhaven eigenlijk al voordat er überhaupt de deuren open gingen. Toen uh, werd er al gezegd van, goh Rien, waar ben je nou zo, uh, waar ben je nou het meest trots op? En toen zei ik, ho ho, uh, dat gaat wel een beetje snel. Laten we eerst eens eventjes uh, zorgen dat het er staat en dat het ook gaat draaien. En dan zullen we over een aantal jaar zullen we wel zien. Desondanks heeft de gemeente besloten al vrij snel dat het de startblokformule, dat het beleid werd in de gemeente Amsterdam. Met tijdelijke projecten, maar ook met, uh, met uh, vastgoed van de gemeente, dat werd verkocht aan corporaties. En waar we volgens de formule van 50, 50 procent, allemaal jonge mensen, dat we uh, op die manier uh, de huisvesting zouden regelen voor statushouders in Amsterdam. Nou, ze zijn er op dit moment, uh, nou, een stuk of 10, 11 uh, complexen zijn er opgeleverd. Op Eiburg, in Oost, uh, bij Stadgenoot, uh, bij uh, Stek Oost, uh, Rotsdeel met uh, Spark Village. Pieter zit daar ook. Uh, en we zijn er allemaal weer. Uh, de Alliantie, ja, het is echt een soort van clan uh, geworden. Uh, um, de Alliantie met een aantal uh, projecten. En uh, de Kei gaat binnenkort ook uh, uh, aan de slag met uh, Stadblok aan de Wormerveerstraat. Dat is een permanent complex. Nou ben ik geloof ik echt door mijn tijd heen. Nou ja, dus dit is dan zeg maar het programma voor vanavond. Hè. Dan ga ik weer lekker in de zaal zitten. Dan heb ik mijn invalbeurt gehad. En dan ga ik lekker luisteren van hoe het nou uiteindelijk in de praktijk uh, allemaal is geworden. Dankjewel. Je mag nog heel veel blijven staan, want ik wil nog even een vraag stellen. Ja. Ik, uh, ik doe nog even de vraag in het uh, Nederlands en zo meteen switchen we naar, naar het Engels. Um, Ring, ik was wel benieuwd, is het nou eigenlijk gebruikelijk dat een wonenbouwcoöperatie ook zo zich bezig gaat met het sociale aspect van wonen? Um, nou, we worden er wel op bevraagd. Natuurlijk niet, dat is niet onze primaire taak. Onze primaire taak is natuurlijk uh, huisvesting verzorgen. Ja. Uh, maar we, dit was wel een hele bijzondere opgave natuurlijk. Waar wij niet van tevoren uh, zeker wisten of dat nou allemaal zo in één keer helemaal goed zou gaan. Dus het was, had wel onze volledige attentie hmm. en aandacht. Van, we moeten hier meer doen dan uh, uh, normaal gesproken. Ja. Ja. En dus daarom hebben we wel een heel omlijstend programma ook gemaakt. Hè. Ook met die introductiedagen, met een andere beheervorm. Uh, uh, ja, dat is dus echt wel heel bijzonder geweest, ook voor onze organisatie. Daar hebben we ook veel van geleerd. Ja. Is er nog iets wat de andere corporaties die ook aanwezig zijn misschien willen toevoegen aan dit verhaal? Ik kijk jullie even direct aan, heren. Ja. <laughs> ja. Ja. Zijn er nog vragen voor Rink uit de zaal? Are there any questions from the room? Ja, wacht even, ik kom naar je toe. I'm going to ask in English. Um, can you tell a bit more about the funding of the corporations? Is that public or private, or how does that work here? Uh, something in between. It is uh, public and uh, private. We are private organizations, and we are uh, we are funded in the um, uh, years ago by public money. Yeah. 
this Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? <laughs> Uh, technically, yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then next uh, question is, uh, what uh, impact do you think that has had in this project? Would it have, would it have been possible without public funds? Um, well, I don't know. I don't, uh, I have not uh, found any uh, um, other projects funded by private partners uh, in, the, in the city or in, in the Netherlands. Um, I don't know. I don't know that. No. Do I see you want to answer? Or? Well, um, um, these projects are also... Sorry, could you please first say who you are, what you work for? Yeah. Uh, Jan Willem Kluit, uh, Stadgenoot uh, Housing Association. Um, these um, projects were also subsidized by the municipality of Amsterdam, and I don't think that it was possible without that uh, subsidy. Uh, so uh, most of it was paid by... Uh, our own funds, but uh, also from the municipality. So it definitely plays a big role, yeah. Thank you so much, Rink. Please give him a hand of applause. <laughs> hand of applause. I already said that the municipality is not here tonight as a speaker, uh, but we did want to give you some information that the municipality uh, was planning to share with you. So we're going to look at some of the parts of the policy that the muni municipality has developed for status holders and what that means. So when we look at the status holders here in uh, Amsterdam, most of them come from Syria, Eritrea, Ethiopia or Iran. Um, in the last three years, the municipality of Amsterdam arranged housing for 3,000 sta uh, st uh, status holders and a thousand of them are youngsters. That's no coincidence because the municipality of uh, Amsterdam actually has a lot of housing for one person households. So that means that most young people that come along uh, will have a place here in Amsterdam as well. Um, there is more. Most newcomers are, are between the ages 18 and 26. As I said before, one person households again. Uh, and and 97, uh, 79 exist of one person households. And what's interesting is that um, the, the arrangement of the assignment of status holders and their, uh, their housing is done by the organization COA, Centraal Orgaan Opvang Asielzoekers. Uh, and they assign the status holders uh, to a, a city or a municipality uh, not of choice, mostly random. But they do keep in mind if you have a work opportunity in a, in a city or a municipality or if you have studies somewhere, if you have family living somewhere or if you have medical requirements that need you to live somewhere. And I'm, I'm looking at the municipality, yeah, I'm saying it right. Um, but mostly it's random. So there's no preferences that go into play for the status holders. And also when we talk about the projects today, the status holders don't have a choice to live there. They just get assigned a project uh, where the young Dutch people actually have to apply for the project and have a choice uh, in that. Do you have something to add maybe from the municipality, no? Okay, good, good, I was clear. Any questions about this? How the municipality has, what's also interesting is that the municipality actually set the goal that they want to place the status holders into mixed projects so that mixed projects actually enforce uh, integration. So that's something, ex ex they are inspired by the first project but the municipality also said that's our policy that we want uh, to enforce. Yes, I have a question back there. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Razan. I'm from Syria and uh, I live in Amsterdam now. Thank God. <laughs> it was a long process. Uh, thank you. Uh, but the question is, is there a plan on changing this policy on random uh, choosing or uh, is it going to be like this forever? Good question. Anybody knows the answer here in the audience? I haven't heard of any plans to change this, uh, actually. Um, no, I'm looking at the municipality that I, that I know that is here, and they're, they're saying also no. Yeah. As far as I know, there is no discussion on whether um, you could change the system on a national basis, because they really want every municipality to take their own share of the number of people that are assigned the status. Um, and then when you have been assigned with a, a specific municipality where you can go and live, 
then there is the system of random placement. This, this is for everybody that has an urgency. So people that have an urgency that can have uh, advantages and priority on other people to find a house. Always these people are assigned a house. They have no freedom of choice. And what kind of urgency are we talking about? It could be that you're hom uh, homeless with lots of m mental other problems. Uh, it could be status holders. It could be people that have uh, uh, domestic violence problems. There's a lot of different reasons why people can get an urgency for social or medical reasons as well. Uh, but all these people, all these target groups have um, uh, are assigned a house. They have no freedom of choice. What's your background that you know this? Uh, I'm the director of the Federation of Housing Associations in the Netherlands. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're going to move on to the next part. And this is actually a part that we're going to hear about the experiences of living in these kinds of projects. So I want to invite three residents that actually currently live in one of the projects that you, that you just saw on the map. Um, please, Kaspar Kolmees, uh, Paula Smit, and David Al-Bilal. Give them a round of applause, please. Sit, feel welcome on stage. Um, let's get something to drink. David, I wanted to start with you. Um, can you maybe introduce yourself? Where do you live? Yeah. Should I use the yes, we must use the mic. Yeah. So, hello everyone. I am uh, David. I live uh, in the Netherlands since two years. I'm living at uh, Starburg Elsenhagen since one and a half months. And I work also as a project maker in the same project. And I'm studying uh, political science at the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you're saying you're a project maker. What, what does that mean exactly? So your responsibility actually to uh, for brandveiligheid, mm -hmm. which is like for fire security, your, yeah, yeah, something like this, and to um, to make sure that everything is going well in the in the in the project and nobody have any problems and yeah. yeah, to make sure like this. And as I said before, as a status holder, you're not, you don't have a choice to live there. It does it, is that the way it went for you as well? Didn't, did you get assigned to this? Uh, well, actually before that I lived in uh, NDSM Werf. Yeah. It's like uh, a project approved by uh, Rochdale yeah. Association. So uh, I get this uh, house like an offer and bidding from mm -hmm. Community Amsterdam because they will move this uh, place. Mm. They will replace with uh, new buildings, actually. So yeah. I get this offer from the Gemeente Amsterdam. And what did you expect when you started living there and you heard this is a community living project? What well, actually, um, to be honest, I was not like so many optimistic okay. because I, don't, I didn't have like an experience, good experience when since I wasn't in uh, NDSM. Mm. But actually now I can imagine myself living out Starblock Elsenhagen. Mm. Yeah, they are so, we have amazing uh, um, innovement uh, people, like sometimes if I didn't see my neighbors every day, like I call them, guys, where are you? I need to, I, I miss th something actually. Uh -huh. So I, 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 yeah, I, I think like this kind of project and especially Starbuck Elsenhagen is like um, a successful uh, example for, for integration and for uh, status holders mm. as well. And what, what for you is the difference from liv living in the NDSM that isn't a community living project to where you're living now? Uh, actually, uh, you know, when you you have like a refugee after, um, background, yeah. so you have like a problem with um, in some height. Yeah, like loneliness. Loneliness and um, you, you miss some, you miss kind of, you miss kind of this relations, this, this mm. warm relations, you know, mm. you don't have any uh, family here. Um, yeah, it's a new country, you know, uh, you have like a language to learn, you have to, yeah, to determine what, which way you will go, are you study or uh, will you uh, work, you need to build uh, a network. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, I think, Starblock Elsenhagen or this kind of projects help you to, like, deal with everything yeah. like this. We'll get into how they exactly help, so what is in yeah. place, but first, let yeah. me point my attention to the other guest, Kasper. Yeah. Could you please introduce yourself, where do you live, and how did you get there? Yeah, so I'm a Dutch youngster, and I'm from Amsterdam. Maybe a bit closer to the mic, yes. And I, and I uh, live in uh, Stack Oost. Yeah. Yeah. And I uh, live in Stack Oost. I'm um, also from, from the east of Amsterdam, from the Watergrafmeer, where Stack Oost is also 
uh, based and uh, I'm studying at the UVM. Yeah. And you didn't get assigned. You had to sign yourself up, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And why did you decide to, to, to want to live there? To yeah, try? so uh, for me, I think key was that a lot of people, that there was going to be a community. Mm -hmm. I think the idea is very nice that there are people that are trying to be involved with their neighbors, whether they are uh, status holders or not. Yeah. Uh, just the idea that uh, people are just making an extra step uh, to support each other. And also, I guess, uh, this not, o not only by the residents, but also by the housing associations, there's uh, a, a living room, a shared living room. Mm. I think, yeah, those are extra ingredients uh, that make living nice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And those were maybe your expectation that that would be nice. Mm -hmm. uh, did those, those expectations come true? Um, I mean, yeah, uh, s some of them, some of them did. Uh, community is, of course, a very big word, as is integration. Mm, so um, there is, and and we, are, I, I've been living there now for five months. So I can say some of it is going, is going good. There are commissions to assigned to do uh, to do stuff on the garden or do to do uh, start sport activities. Yeah. Um, but there's also uh, some things that are maybe. Uh, yeah, for example, like I'm very happy to hear that you have a lot of connection with your hallway and my hallway is maybe a bit big mm. and I get a feeling like there's not like um, an extra like a subgroup. Uh, How many people are living in your hallway? 36. Wow. Yeah. And it is uh, one big hallway. Yeah, it's one. So we've got two kind of hallways. One is smaller and yeah. one is bigger. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's it's only because of it's it's bigger. It's also due to the people who are living there. Um, maybe also the community builder that's active, but uh, for us it feels like a little bit anonymous, mm. uh, a bit more than I would have hoped on th on that hallway. But then again, like there's stuff to do for all residents, um, and if you want, you can always be active yeah. in those mm. um, activities. It's interesting that you named a community builder because we actually have a community builder right here, <laughs> Paula. <laughs> could you introduce yourself, yeah. please? Uh, my name is Paula, uh, and I am a community builder at Spark Village. Uh, I studied philosophy of education, uh, and now I work as a researcher, teacher, slash teacher at the University of Applied Sciences. I'm a community builder. <laughs> what, what does it mean? What does it entail, a community builder? Uh, the, the word in Dutch is aanjager, I think. Ah. Uh, but in English, you would say, like, activating. So it's not that we, like do the work for the residents, but that we are, on the one hand, we're like activating uh, residents. And you are also a resident, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. also a resident. Uh, and every every community builder has his own block. Mm -hmm. I think it's similar with, with Tech O's. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's not that we like organize all the activities, but that we, you know, activate residents, you know, to come up with great ideas and do things. Uh, and on the other hand, we like a mediator between the parties, you know, mm -hmm. the formal parties who are involved. Uh, so we have like this signal function, mm -hmm. this signalier function. Yes. Uh, and at the same time, yeah. Um, what kind there. of formal parties are we talking about? Uh, I think you saw them also at the, at the, so the presentation. That's Flutling of the and and Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Javier Querido and Dinamo yeah. and uh, the municipality and Rochdo, of course. Yeah. Uh, and I'm forgetting one. Oh, yeah, Ikayo is yeah. also involved. Yeah. And I understood that you are part of an organization as well, Academy from yeah. Stad. Yeah. Oh, so sorry, Academy from Stad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you can you tell us a little yeah. bit about what what does Academy from Stad do? Uh, Academy <laughs> from Stad um, works with uh, mostly students, but also with youngsters, uh, and they do s different kinds of projects. But um, one of their projects are like uh, living projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only with refugees, but also with other um, um, communities who have this question, so for example, connection uh, mm. or other questions. Uh, and they also have like, you know, uh, they work with the HVA and uh, other um, uh, education, mm. uh, uh, how do you call them? <laughs> Universities and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So Very interesting. So I think something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Academy van der Stad is also in yeah, the room, yeah, they're, so. They're, they're <laughs> yeah, they're all there. Um, do you guys know each other's projects as well? Did, did I know you your project. Mm -hmm. And yeah. your project, not so good. I don't know about No? no. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, yeah. But it's interesting because then we have the different perspectives yeah, of all yeah. the projects. Yeah. What would you say works well? And then mostly I want to talk about the community part, the more integration development, yeah. so the social part of the, of the projects. What would you say is like 
really working well. Um, maybe I can, yeah, yeah go on. Um, actually, what I noticed like in, in Starbuck of the first, well, we are like two months, it's not like, you know, you should give it time some, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. But like for the Dutch uh, guys, like they are so busy with study, you know, if you suggest like an activity or something, okay, we are so busy with the study, mm-hmm. with work and yeah, especially here in Amsterdam, I can imagine that as well. But sometimes you need to just try, mm-hmm. just like, is there any activity or Sam Aiton or mm-hmm. something, you know, you can um, involved with, just like try the first step. And you give also the, the person who in front of you, like, the, the space also to explain himself as well. Yeah. So I think like, how we call it this? Mm. Do the first step. To take initiative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just do the first step. And when you take initiative, do, is it a WhatsApp group? Is it that you go from door to door to ring the we, bells? We have actually really uh, effect, uh, effective or efficient structure. Like we mm. have also Facebook page, uh, Facebook group. We have like we, we are in contact with all ham makers mm. in WhatsApp and, uh, and, and emails as well. Yeah. So everybody here knows if, if there are any activity or, or something like this. So yeah. just like do the first step. Just Take like, initiative. yeah. So with like the integration, which be from the both side, mm. you know, mm-hmm. because as well as, as the, 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 the status holders, like see this as a new thing, should also the, the, the Dutch uh, guys as well doing the, the first step. Yeah. And do you see difference between take initiative from the, the status holders versus the, the local Dutch young people? Well, I can sometimes give an excuse for, yeah, for status holders mm-hmm. because, you know, it's something totally new for them. Of course. It's like, yeah, God, it's like something new. How can I handle it? Yeah, mm-hmm. I see many difference. So that's why, like, should, yeah, the first step more the, the, the Dutch size, you know, yeah. the, the Dutch guy's size. Yeah. That's yeah. My, my perspective, actually. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, in a way, like Dutch people chose to live there, so mm-hmm. maybe you can address that. I think also like next to initiative, um, also it's important to show like it's a very low threshold to get involved. So just yeah, like show people that it's very easy to just show up. Um, you don't even have to like uh, s- um, start. Like yeah, you don't have to make an appointment. Mm-hmm. You don't have to mm-hmm. uh, come up with an idea to to go to do an activity, Mm. to have a new activity, but you can just like show up. And I think if people know that it's like that easy, if you made that first step once, then you know next time it's gonna be easy as well. So is there a threshold at the beginning for people to to start coming to the first events? Of course, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's personality. Um, Some people are busy. Some people make up excuses for for themselves why they cannot come. Yeah. Um, But yeah, uh, so. Yeah, I, I do think like in the beginning because we housed in like in one month yeah. and everybody at, at the same time. So in the beginning, like it's very easy to say like, okay, we're going to do this together and all the noses, you know, the same side. But to make it sustainable, that that's that's like that's really nice to do because <laughs> you're really occupied with it. Mm. But at the same time, it's like a really big challenge Yeah. Uh, because everybody, what you said, is really busy. So it's f- for example, I always bike, you know, through Science Park and you see like the student clubs. They come together. Uh, I already told uh, you got you did, uh, <laughs> but they come together because they're they're already connected before they made contact because they have this mutual interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this community is made out of diversity, mm. uh, like cultural, but also what you say, personality and stuff. Yeah. So you see, like people have their own life, very busy. You know, you have this society that wants everything from you, uh, and at the same time, you. They're 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 coming, you know, newcomers yeah. who also have like this this big agenda with things they have to do and training they have to follow. So and then the social part on top of it, yeah. you know, to to make a current whole out of the community that's really challenging. But at the same time, there are a lot of possibilities. So yeah. like within this society, I think it's a really good way of integration. Yeah, to integrate. Sorry. And for the people that maybe don't know these projects, mm-hmm. it, it might be quite hard to actually picture what happens there. Is it just people living side by side or what? Can you, three of you all give an, a, an example of what happened or a nice example that you think that was really uh, a nice example to show what this project is all about? I have to think one second. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, especially here in, 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 uh, in this month, it's Ramadan, oh, so for, for Muslim uh, community. Yeah. Like uh, there is a group of 
yeah, South Southers and and and, and Dutch guys, they have like an open uh, open table, mm -hmm. and they invite like if everyone like uh, want to share this this iftar uh, table, he is welcome. So it was really good good example for this. Yeah. I see. We have the same too. Yeah, a few days a week. I think it's 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 a really good uh, example. So somebody in their own apartment invites other people to join. Yeah, yeah, N it's not like apartment. We have like we share the common space. Oh, the common the space. Common yeah. space. Yeah. We share like if there any activity or something. So it was like really um, a nice a mm. nice thing. Mm. Was it once one time or is it? Uh, he he do it one 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 times. Okay. So it's just like an a good example. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think a good example was when we started uh, on the garden. So um, it was a bit funny. I think we had a lot of compost, compost, mm -hmm. uh, and it was like it had to be brought to the garden. And we were joking a bit, like, why did they not like just drive it there <laughs> instead of like 50 <laughs> yeah. meters from there? But I guess it was like a good way of of, uh, they did of it on getting, purpose. getting, getting to, to know yeah. each other, <laughs> yeah, starting community. Yeah. So, uh, but that was fun. I mean, we we uh, we did it with like 30 people uh -huh. to move it, and then like. Uh, to divide everything yeah. and then and then we had uh, eastern uh, eastern lunch together afterwards mm. yeah nice. that's also nice because what you said you don't necessarily have something in common when you just live there a garden is of course something so everybody has in common so that yeah yeah i can see that that works nice yeah. did uh, you think of something yeah yeah I, I agree with both of you because the green uh i think green connects too and also the iftars we have like three times a week now uh and everybody can come in but i think the example i thought about when i was biking here uh, what, what was like a really successful thing is I have to think about one group from Eritrea uh, uh, and also in relation to the integration mm -hmm. debate. Uh, they didn't went to an asset say, a refugee. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they, they didn't. No, they didn't. So uh, the idea was to like, you know, to, to in a normal way, like to, you know, house them immediately. Uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't house immediately, so they went to the Belmont Bios Hotel. Mm -hmm. But we, as community builders, went to them before we w uh, housed in. So we already, you know, made ah, contact with them, them, made made food with them, just really low threshold. Yeah. Uh, and in the beginning, it, w it was yeah, there there was this tension and there were some incidents, so it was really hard. Huh. But now, if you look at it four months later, five months now, if you see them biking and you know living already, so I think the integration process. It's and more sustainable, and it went way faster than if you put people somewhere and you know make them wait before yeah. they they learn about everything, but they don't live and experience it. Yeah. So if you see now, if you see them biking and say like, "Hey, how are you? <laughs> How's it?" and you know, I don't know, you see them like flourishing or something. Yeah. So uh, I Beautiful. think that's a really nice example of. Uh, Thanks. I want to give the audience the opportunity to maybe ask a question. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, um, I want to know, how, w what do you share? Like, do you share, for example, the bathroom, the shower, the kitchen, or do you have it for yourselves and you have only a shared common room? Yeah, that last Thanks. one. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, yeah, I think the same in all our projects. W you have your own studio, and then next to that you have uh, common rooms, so that yeah. differs a, a bit per project. So you have your own uh, bathroom, you have your own shower. I'm just sorry to say, yeah. And I understood, in, uh, understood in some branches there are also uh, shared living where you just have their own room and you share yeah, there, an, yeah. Uh, the kitchen with three people, right? Something like that. Actually, I I have have idea. I'm not really sure about this. Maybe another person. Okay, so the standard is own studio with, yeah. with, a, with a bathroom. Any other questions? Yes. As a Dutch um, youngster, how do you know about the project? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think a friend sent it to me on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Just tag. <laughs> it's that easy. I yeah. actually did a, did a project at Academie van der Stad um, in, another, uh, in uh, another part in the East for like four years before this. Uh, so this is the second one I do. And before that, I was also a friend that I met at a, at a parade festival. <laughs> so connected, m mostly, I think, informal. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. yeah. But also yeah. formal. Oh, it's also on boning net. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's the formal way to get to uh, yeah. living. <laughs> that's the formal way. Yeah. yeah. And you said we. Yeah, Starbuck Elsnagen. Yeah. They uh, made publicity on social media. 
Yeah, so you, you get informed online through social media yeah. or friends, and then you know when it's coming up uh, on Voning Nuts. Yeah, and you actually have to apply, right? You have to write a motivation. Uh, there, there are more people wanting to live there than they can. Yeah, uh, it's Amsterdam. So yeah, <laughs> it's popular. I, I had to like like do a vacancy at a, as, as a yeah. community builder. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, could you maybe tell something about any weaknesses in the project? <laughs> What what can be improved? Good want to get to the juicy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's it, it it's like there are there there are these big ideals and you have a lot of ideas also with your community building team but also the residents but everyone is very busy uh, so you know to make it work like in a good manner. Uh, sometimes it's not possible because you're you're just too busy for it. So time and energy is something you want more. <laughs> yeah. So that that's a thing uh, as a community builder. But yeah, maybe I'd like to add that maybe responsibility because you've got the community builders, but for them it's also a lot of people think oh they are gonna make yeah. sure the community happens, and I think the mm. to transfer this responsibility is definitely like yeah. a bit of an issue. Some people don't know exactly what community builders are, what they are for, uh, and <coughs> how much they should or can do themselves. Yeah, the activating work is really challenging. Yeah. Or activating. Sure. Yeah. Uh, design net, just like <laughs> one, yeah. One, uh, yeah, one and a half months. So yeah. there is nothing like serious challenging right now. Yeah. But it will be in the future, of course. Definitely. For right now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're out of time for yeah. now. So thank you so much. Yeah. And later on, we have a discussion. We'll hear from you. Thanks. And to really compare the successfulness or maybe what doesn't go right in these projects, we also need to have the perspective of somebody that entered uh, the Netherlands and didn't have the opportunity to live in a mixing uh, uh, community like this. So that's why we invited uh, Mohamed Batran uh, to come here and to, to, to speak to us. Please come on stage. Welcome. I understood that you live here in the Netherlands for five years now, right? Almost six. Almost six. Yes. Wow. <coughs> and uh, where do you live now? I live not in Amsterdam, actually. Oh. In Weesp, uh, which is going to be under Amsterdam after the <laughs> referendum. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I live in Weesp. Yes. And do you like where you live now? I like Weesp, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and what kind of home do you have? <coughs> I have actually um, like a social housing, which is an, a small apartment. So I don't have any community living project, no. such a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience <coughs> here over the five years? How did you get your first house here in the Netherlands and, and from the housing career path, as, it, as I might say? Sure. Um, well, first, let me just introduce myself and sure. say, um, well, my name is Mohammed and I'm no, I'm, I, I study at uh, Freie Universiteit Amsterdam, Anthropologie, and uh, I'm a refugee advocate. I have my organization, Syrian Volunteers in the Netherlands, and basically we, um, we help refugees to make sure that they have actually a voice in policymaking yeah. processes, in all policymaking processes. Um, yeah, so my experience, basically, I arrived in 2013, which is, means that uh, before the whole uh, refugee crisis started, mm. um, which is, was in 2015. Uh, so I didn't have that uh, leverage with, you know, having a community living project. W also, I mean, refugee wasn't, you know, such a hot topic at the mm. time. Mm. Um, my issue, which is, I think right now, this project is kind of actually addressing it, which is was actually the moving regularly from one place to another. Mm. So I myself have been moved from different as it says. So mm. I've kind of had a, a, a oh tour, yeah, sure, yeah. a welcome tour in the <laughs> Netherlands. <laughs> so what, what did you see? Uh, t well, Terrapol, Almelo. Terrapol. Terrapol. <laughs> okay, Almelo, Wageningen, yes. um, Arnhem, the Utrecht, uh, Nijmegen, and then Amsterdam. That's insane. And, and wha in what time span is all these places? Um, I think it's like, like, relatively short. Mm. Um, I, I guess um, eight months mm. and then to a year. Yeah. And did it change when you become became a status holder? 
Uh, no, it didn't change because uh, so basically was that um, there's like some kind of as it says, which is um, you live in before you get your status. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of you're waiting in a limbo and then you don't have uh, anything to do until uh, there is, uh, you know, there is your interviews actually should should start. Um, and then there's like these special as it says, which is made only for um, refugees who are waiting for a house. Yeah. Yeah, and it was for me very hard because they wanted to still like move me to one of the villages. Well, we heard in the, uh, before about I mean the policies and how is that actually being yeah. divided, which is I think the problem um, and also addressed by someone there is that uh, refugees are being seen in a kind of in a burden, right? Mm. So uh, all Jimenez like they are sharing that burden, they are sharing that randomly, without taking into account these people potentials and uh, their future and what they want to do so my, my issue was was also the same because they wanted uh, at first they want to put me in a uh, very a small village in the middle of the Netherlands uh, it's called uh, Maurik uh, I don't know if anybody knows yeah. I have well I think it. that made my point yeah. <laughs> Um, um, and I wanted to study and I wanted to uh, yeah. continue my education. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when you say they, who are, who are we exactly talking about? Um, I mean, the COA basically. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. the, the main one who actually assign people to what? Mm. Um, yeah. But because also the, what I'm saying is that, uh, I mean, refugees, they don't have any kind of contact with the Gemeente or any other uh, decision makers, yeah. only actually the COA. Mm. And it, I mean, at some points, as we hear, um, some people actually they're they are benefiting, whatever it comes that. But it it is it is actually kind of unfair because it is not the same kind of. Um, um, uh, they are not taking all refugees in the same way. Mm. Um, so it is for so some people if they understood uh, people issues and people uh, concerns, then they will take them, for example, and put them in Amsterdam. Mm. But others they will like. Okay, well, we, they will we will just ignore your wishes, and then you are just kind of end up in a village. And what would make the the COA uh, understand someone's issues and uh, what not? There is no specific criteria. That's what I'm saying. So I'm, I mean, you mentioned about uh, the work thing. Yeah. But I mean, that's also unlogic because um, if you are just arriving to to the Netherlands, mm. you wouldn't have a contract. No. Um, you know, to move to uh, to a city, or we, you wouldn't be accepted in a university because there is a lot of problem, which is uh, y your diploma is not accepted. Then you're not mm. you're not you don't have an access to education, university. So you can't actually prove that you want to uh, mm. continue your uh, future here. Especially not when you're not a status holder yet, Yeah. right? And it's also interesting that you said they don't uh, keep account of the potential that you have. What do you mean especially with that potential uh, as, a, as, as a refugee or maybe a status holder already? Um, well, potentials, I mean, I mean talents, mm -hmm. but also um, your qualifications. So mm -hmm. basically, whether it is a diploma, whether your skills, the, the things that you would like to, uh, to continue with it. Mm. Um, one thing that uh, was mentioned when the presentation was given uh, uh, by, the, by the Kai, uh, the Kai, right? <laughs> um, yes, uh, better than me. <laughs> 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 um, it was uh, the challenges and, and I mean, understood that uh, the project at the beginning wasn't really addressing integration. And right now we are going to discuss what is integration and what is not. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, w it would be make sense to also uh, focus on if, if it's going to uh, take, I mean, address integration then in what way would that be possible? And um, for example, if we are, I mean, my integration for me, it is that you be able to participate and contribute to the society. Mm. So how could such a project be um, focusing on such a thing? Yeah. Uh, or how can we address refugees to go beyond the word refugee um, to, act to address them as an active agents mm. in the society? Um, it's not a burden, but actually something that can exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean the whole thing, the refugee label, it it is experienced as well a paradox. I yeah. will explain because um, at the one hand, it is true that refugees, I mean, they're arriving in the Netherlands and th they need uh, some kind of help. But also, um, uh, this refugee label also takes away refugee agency. Mm. So y you you're always being perceived as passive, as victims, mm. and that is also one way that how we should always look ab about how we are actually addressing refugees in every project or in, or in every policy. That's very interesting. And, and do you have any ideas how we can change that, how we can make refugees have more agencies or st status holders themselves? 
Well, I mean, um, I, I found it interesting, but I don't know. I don't know how. I mean, I think we are here today also to think. Uh, I mean, I, d I don't know about the project. Mm -hmm. I haven't experienced myself. I heard about it. Uh, but I mean, we heard a lot about uh, how um, Dutch uh, youngsters, they actually um, apply and then they sign themselves. And but yeah. I understood that refugees, they are being assigned. Yes, that's and, right. And that's... I mean, uh, in maybe end up in a in a good well, but mm -hmm. at the same time, um, we are uh, how are we consulting refugees? What is their voice? What is their opinion in all of that? And how how is that actually taken into consideration? So yeah. that may be something that we all can uh, think about. Yeah, definitely. Of course, we hope that these projects actually give status holders um, the chance or maybe the access to have more social interaction with people that already live here for a longer time. How was that for you, not having such a project? How did you get in contact with local Dutch people? Did you get in contact with us? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, basically, I, th I think that's that's one of the things. So meaningful uh, connections. Mm -hmm. And I think this project um, has shown a showcase actually how this is a, a being addressed and a being provided. And I think a lot of the community managers, I mean, they, they have been shown that. I think being connected in someone in your age, it is very important. Yeah. I didn't get that. And I wouldn't get it because, I mean, think with me, I mean, where w where there is such a space mm -hmm. where I would be in contact with people with my age, except for university or work, even yeah. work is not really my age. But yeah. I mean, uh, that I mean, you got my point. So so basically, I didn't get um, in contact with people in my age, I think, until I started my university, which is uh, three years later. Uh, from I mean the Dutch courses or the Emburgen courses mm -hmm. you go there but it's only I mean people who the same as you yeah. are studying Dutch yeah. so yeah. it's not really you're n you don't have any contact no. with so after three years maybe you have the studies where you can have such contact is that a place where you can make contact with people from a meaningful contact I mean yeah 100 percent yes I mean yes mm -hmm. yeah I, d I mean also I mean mm, well my work uh, provides me with a lot of contacts but yeah. yes yeah. university and then, of course, it's interesting to to think about if housing maybe is that place. Is housing the place where you can create meaningful content? What do you think? I I think I think yes. I think if, um, as I said, if we want uh, policies, uh, housing policies that actually addressing integration, mm -hmm. then we should look about. I mean, such projects. Um, a very good example, actually, I was I was this morning um, in Pageningen. Uh, to together we were doing uh, with uh, building places. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, <laughs> with the uh, gemeente, with the uh, and, and there's a very actually good example that one gemeente they started to implement um, kind of intakes. Uh, so because of the new law that is coming uh, in the coming two years about mm -hmm. int integration and the whole integration policy is going to be changed. It was called BIP, uh, which is persoonlijk plan uh, integratie and participatie. Mm -hmm. And then what, what the gemeente actually, it's like their own initiative, they took it, is actually to start making these personal connection with the, with, with the newcomers, with uh, the status holders, uh, while they're actually in the, in the, in the COA, mm -hmm. while they're actually, at the, as it says, so mm -hmm. they're going there and they're explaining um, before actually they're getting the house, what are the potentials, what are the opportunities that they actually they can get mm. um, to kind of open their, what is your future and what, are, wh what can you actually reach here? Yeah. And I think these kind of, um, I mean, um, examples that can actually be implemented and repeated everywhere. I think this project is very good, but it's also, it's, it's kind of making, again, I'm, I'm maybe I'm addressing maybe the random, but also the unfair about mm -hmm. who will actually get the chance to live in such a place and who is not. And I think more of these projects are needed in other cities yeah. than actually in Amsterdam. Yeah. I mean, it's good. I mean, all Amsterdam always give good examples, but yeah. I think it's also the idea, how can we take these examples and implement it and yeah. as a best practice? Hopefully they're watching the, the other municipalities. I hope too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, I see one immediately. Um, I'm just wondering about uh, how about a community, uh, like, uh, like the side of creating a, co a community inside a community. So when you're uh, impla imp imp like placing or uh, housing uh, refugees uh, from Syria together in the same area with refugees from Eritrea from the same in the same area. And I noticed it a little bit, I live in Starblock for two years and a half, almost three years now. And what I noticed that um, 
actually communities are being more close to each other than actually opening to the new community. So there's no real mixing going that's on. That's my question. Like, how can that be solved, or how can can this like uh, if if that's the potential from the project? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you want to say something about this. Um. Um. I mean, I think not. Um. I'm, well, I'm not the one who no. should talk about the project, but I think um to add maybe to this point is that whether we should be maybe focusing on that because i don't know i mean the whole th the idea of putting a group of people together it is actually not natural mm. so it doesn't actually happen in other in any other society so um do we want to get to get to that point or is it this something more normal uh, within societies to actually form these kind of small communities but also make sure um i mean uh, addressing integration which is i mean participating in that society and contributing to it. Yeah. yeah, I think your question is very good, and th but especially for later when, when you have a discussion when we really evaluate okay, what is the pros and the cons of these projects, we will get back to you and uh, your question as well. Is there a question maybe to for Mohammed himself as he's sitting here in front? Yes. What were factors for you to? Um, yeah, find connection or integration with Dutch people. Um, um, the the factors. Um, I guess uh, university, as uh, as I mentioned, uh, was one of these um, the first spaces where I uh, started to get in contact with a very normal way. Um, not like uh, with volunteers, not with um, you know uh, organizations or uh, people who just are interested in refugees. So I think that was one of the spaces that I actually experienced uh, more uh, that way. Maybe I can add one more thing. Yeah, sure. Um, just I maybe something I forgot is that uh, because I mentioned uh, there was mentioning about uh, the culture differences and barriers and how is that can be managed as a challenge and I think it's also to take into account how um, there there's a lot of refugees who came five six years um, or three years that are actually right now kind of like slow to the person like at the key for the community so mm -hmm. actually they can be part of maybe a uh, community manager, and then we, s we saw David, I think that's a very good example. But I mean, how can we take more of these examples uh, who are actually, what they were refugees, they know all the challenges yeah. and the experience, and then put them in a, in a place where actually they can uh, contribute. Yeah, perfect. That's it for now. Thank, Thank you so you. much. And when we really want to talk about these projects and their effectiveness, we also have to know what we mean when we talk about integration. What does integration actually mean? It's quite a big question. Mohamed already gave a, a good, good answer to what integration actually means. Uh, but our next guest is going to talk a little bit more about that. She's a PhD candidate uh, here at the University of Amsterdam in uh, political theory. Am I saying that right? Yes. And she is uh, studying the conceptualization and measurement of integration in the context of international migration. Please give a warm welcome to Lea Klarenbeek. Okay, that was a lot of light. Um, Thanks very much for uh, for inviting me here. I'm I'm really really thrilled actually to be here, and I'm really really happy that the organization and the, the the program makers also decided to spend some time on this question of what integration actually is. Because we, if we want to know if policy is successful, and if we want to know if these if we want to evaluate these kinds of projects on integration, you kind of need an idea of what you what it is that you're looking for. What it is that what is it that we want to to um, get out of this and. I started my dissertation on the question, what is integration, three years ago, and I have regretted it many times, <laughs> um, because it's such a political term, and it's so loaded, and it's, so it's, it's, it's taken on so much political salience, and it's used and abused massively. Um, and I think there's an increasing amount of very problematic understandings of integrations that are being used based on xenophobic, racist, or other very problematic assumptions. and. So when giving a talk on what integration is, it becomes very tempting to start trying to rebuke all these understandings of integration, um, mainly talking about what integration is not. Um, so I was writing my talk and I was 
writing down all my angry sentences. And at one point I was like, you know what? No, I'm going to stop doing this because it, it's also very limiting in a more positive project. Of what, is it, what is it that we do want? Um, so I'm going to try to stay away from the more mainstream political uh, understandings of integration. And I will kind of want to invite you to do the same. Um, so I'm not going to talk about integration in terms of integ uh, integration policies, such as civic integration tests. I'm not going to be talking about that at all. Um, I will stay away from trying to analyze political claims of cultural adaptations of the idea that there is this set of typically Dutch progressive liberal values that newcomers need to be taught. Um, because I think that we're here together with people that are actually looking for ways to, you know, give a to think about how do we accommodate difference and how do we, um, so I, I'm hoping to have a more um, constructive talk for you. So I'm going to be talking about three main questions. The first is, what is an integrated society? The second is, what then is an integration process? And the third is, who needs to do it? So who needs to integrate? And um, being a political theorist, I like to keep things very abstract. So I am not talking about a one particular national context. I'm not talking about integration uh, of refugees specifically. I'm going to be talking about integration of um, different groups in general, basically. So when talking about what is, in what is integration, I think a good starting point is to think, what would we consider an integrated society? When do we think that integration is finished? And I was wondering if you have some preliminary ideas on this. Who has an idea of what, how would we know it when we see it? How would we recognize an integrated society? Anyone who, anything that comes to mind? Yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind is peace. Peace, that's really beautiful, yeah. I think that, <laughs> absolutely. I would I would say everybody can participate in society. Participation is a very it's 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 w w w what Mohammed just mentioned as well. Uh, talking to your neighbors. Okay, so something with like social interaction or contact. Maybe people trying to find common ground. Mhm. Mm trying to overcome difference. Inc inclusive. Yes. Very important. So we kind of have this reson like the the idea of integration kind of resonates, I feel like, and it is something to do with inclusiveness, something to do with that participation, something with peace, about which I think so the kind of the absence of conflict maybe, although never mind. Um yes. Um so I think the question is quite difficult to answer, but I think that integration is finished when someone, if we talk about migration, when someone's migration background does not make this person an outsider in society. So in an integrated society, someone's migration background does not affect life chances. Um, in an integrated society, people with a migration background can criticize a political community without being discarded as foreigner. In an integrated society, someone migration, someone's migration background is not an issue. Which does not mean it doesn't exist. It does not mean it needs to be hidden, or that people without a migration background should, uh, with a migration background, should assimilate up to the point that we don't recognize the migration background anymore. But I think it means that the diversity of an immigration society is generally accepted as a domestic form of diversity. So we Dutch citizens, residents, have people amongst us with and without a migration background. But then the question is, how do we get there? And I think the most difficult part about integration is that part of its success depends on people not caring about it anymore. So integration is often being approached, specifically in social sciences, uh, from a perspective of socioeconomic equality. So if newcomers would have the same levels of education, employment, income, then we will have integration. And thereby, the integration process is kind of reduced to a process in which migrants needs to be need to be more developed such that they gain certain skills so that they can take on this new socioeconomically integrated position in society. But what if newcomers do attain or approach the same levels of education, employment and income, and those who are generally regarded as the established Dutch 
would still not acknowledge them as equally worthy citizens. What if the majority of citizens does not want people to be socioeconomically equal? Because it means they will have to share. They will have to share their resources. They will lose their dominant position, and which gives them all kinds of advantages, both material and immaterial. They will probably then try to maintain some kind of social boundary between themselves as those who belong somewhere and the newcomers who do not belong for whatever reason. So this socioeconomic equality is not, I would say, is not exactly the same as integration. And th why I, what I said, is I'm not talking about one specific context, because the markers of this social boundary between insiders and outsiders are highly context dependent. So for example, if we take language as an example, um, which is often named a very central denom uh, denominator for integration. So for the Netherlands to be integrated, it's important that we all understand each other. So everyone should learn Dutch. And of course, learning Dutch will make your life easy in the Netherlands. On the other hand, here we are doing an evening in English, seem to be getting along just fine. And there is many countries in the world where there's people speaking different languages, where you have multiple official languages. So apparently speaking the same language is not some absolutely necessary condition for people to have this shared sense of belonging. It might make it easier, but it's not, it's not a natural um, necessary condition. And if we would consider a more hypothetical example, suppose that there's a country in which all people dye their hair in the colors of the rainbow. And at a certain point, a group of newcomers arrives who keep their own natural hair color. And let's assume that this is the only significant difference between these people. So they speak the same language, they have the same religion, or maybe they don't have any religion, uh, they have a similar class composition, etc. Whether this hair color becomes an issue, whether it becomes an integration issue, will depend on the receiving society's willingness to share their resources and extend their understanding of who belongs to their society. So if they are not willing to open up, hair color may increasingly be perceived as a salient problematic difference between these two categories of people. There may be stories about how not wanting to color your hair is a sign of laziness, of disrespect, of not, not en endorsing peace, whatever the rainbow, whatever the rainbow colored hair may symbolize. So it may thereby become a central marker of a boundary between insiders and outsiders. People with natural hair colors will be categorized as outsiders and have low, lower social status. Even if, notwithstanding this lower social status, the newcomers may do well in education, they find jobs, they stay out of criminal records, there remains an integration problem because they will still be outsiders. And this means that there is no fixed endpoint which can be reached by working down a checklist of practical changes and achievements that will guarantee us an integrated society. So even if newcomers would start to dye their hair in the colors of the rainbow, maybe even their history of having natural hair color or ancestors with a natural hair color may be used against them. So integration does not depend on the hair color. It depends on the receiving society acknowledges, uh, acknowledging newcomers as their equals. So thus far, I have argued that integration, an integrated society is a society in which a migrant background does not make one an outsider. And based on this, I think of integration as a process in which a social boundary between people needs to be overcome. And that kind of brings us to the last question, which is, who then integrates? Who is part of the integration process? And while we see an increase in politicians who argue that newcomers need to fight for their place and they need to show that they are capable and worthy of functioning as a Dutch citizen, um, increasingly maybe even questioning their capacity in the first place, um, amongst researchers and I think also in general policy makers, um, we have, there is this notion of the idea of the integration as a two-way process. So what does that entail, a two-way process? Usually it is emphasized that a receiving society can influence the integration of newcomers by either being helpful or by impeding it. But I don't think this takes it far enough because I think integration can only be attained if the receiving society changes substantially. And as long as the receiving society does not go through this change, migrants can change as much as they like, they can 
learn a new language, they can gain skills, they can vote in national elections, they could change their names, they could convert to a dominant religion, they could try to cover up their migration background, but there's nothing they can do that will ensure that integration will happen, that they will be accepted. So because this acceptance is such a crucial condition for integration to, to happen, I don't think it makes sense to talk about integration as a process of newcomers integrating into a society, a society that apparently is already integrated, that itself does not have any integration problems, or at least not the one, not ones that need to be addressed under the idea of integration. Um, so if you take, for example, the idea of uh, bridging social capital, it's what it's called in social science, and it's the idea that you need context uh, from a different social group than yourself. And the idea is that in the, the way it's being used in measurement is that the more um, people, the for a person with a migration background, the more friends you have without a migration background, the better integrated you are. But what if I, as a Dutch person, do not want to befriend people with a migration background? Who then has an integration problem? In these measurements, o only the migrants turn, up, turn out with, a mi with an integration problem. But it may not be the migrants who are upholding the boundary there. Um, so I think an integration process is so much more than migrants securing their place or gaining skills because we need a, a transformation of society as a whole in which everyone is a participant, um, in which everyone has a share in the problem and the solutions of integration. And people need to integrate with each other because for integration to be successful, we need a new conception of who is us, who def what defines us and who belongs to us. So, I think that when you evaluate projects for their integrative potential, um, it is crucial that we monitor the people without migration background as well. If you want to know something, if you want to know something whether these projects work for integration, uh, you need more information than the socioeconomic positions of the status holders that they have after living in this project. Because I think, um, although there will probably be, sorry, some self-selection the people wanting to live there. But the idea that integration processes are also about the uh, changed conception of, of us, of who is a legitimate um, resident in the Netherlands, who has a right to what, based on what, who should be lucky to be somewhere, who, should be, who has a right to be somewhere, uh, who has the responsibility to make integration happen in the first place. Um, I think these are very important questions if we want to do the evaluations of these projects as well. And that will be it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. Are there any questions for Leah? Yes. Well, uh, for the uh, language. Well, I I know it's a language. It's a way for communicating communicating between people. Like you can in English, French, with the Hebaratalan or whatever. Mm -hmm. But do you think like the language is more like an identity for a society? Like, is that easy maybe for 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 any society? Just like ignoring the language, and and ign ignoring the the, uh, the because the language sometimes like culture as well. Mm -hmm. So like ignoring the language and just like use another language is that okay for any society maybe? And the the, the second question is how much you give the integration policy now from one to ten how much you gave it like yeah yeah rate it <laughs> <laughs> oh god um so the interesting thing is i think one of your question really touches also upon the usefulness of political theory in general because i can say that theoretically language is not a, a necessary condition for integration i think that's true and that puts things in perspective but the other but on the other hand you see that you know well Apart from that, it's very practical. People are very attached, can be very attached to language, right? Um, and I, st for example, I studied in the, in the US for a while, and the US has this conception of itself that they have, like in comparison to Europe, they have much lower standards of, of what integration entails. As long as you speak English, everything will be fine. But then you see Spanish as a language coming up in the US as well, right? Um, so yes, I think it's a very cultural thing. Yes, I think people can become very attached to it. But I think it's very context-dependent context, context dependent how much of an issue it becomes. And 
also in the Netherlands, like the more people will start speaking English in so many different institutes and in, in university and in in on like in, in in jobs, regular jobs as well. I can see that Dutch could become less of an issue. Well, there's also probably people that will m want to defend it more, but on a practical level, who says that we need Dutch? N now we want the rating. <laughs> How do I'm, not, rate the, like the I'm not suggesting that we should all stop speaking Dutch, but no. um, oh damn it! <laughs> sorry, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, sorry, I just <laughs> interrupt, but because I couldn't just stay silent. Regardless, uh, many people still thinking uh, maybe eating Istanbul or Haring is also part of integration, uh -huh. but uh, I'm experiencing many things still, like an out of experience. I'm saying. Dutch language or learning because we are talking now about Dutch language. Uh, learning the Dutch language and speaking the language is a huge step to get integrated. I I, I absolutely I mean I. S I but you passed it like very in a very simple sentence and you said yeah who said that we have to, but it is because I have experienced many events where I was really isolated because I couldn't speak and understand Dutch. No, absolutely. That's what pushed me so hard to learn Dutch as fast as possible. Of course, we are speaking English right now, but yeah. this doesn't make it like a sm small issue, you know? Yeah. Uh, what I meant Thank when you. I said is I, that we might not need it is not as a practical statement, as in Dutch will not make a difference for people here in any ways. I'm just saying that Dutch is important because so many, because we make it important. Be and I think as soon, like, but it's a hap hypothetical thing. Like I'm, I don't mean it. I don't mean it to. I don't mean it to say that on a on a daily basis Dutch will not make a difference. I'm just saying that Dutch is important because so many people speak Dutch. But if people will stop speaking Dutch or they will start speaking several languages, then it may become less important. I I, I don't want to uh, get ha hung up on this uh, issue because we have more speakers to come. Thanks for um, saving me from the rating question. But, by the way. <laughs> but I also think. It's always a difficult question when we t ask somebody to talk about the theory of things and to look into what is the global essence of what we're talking about and then having personal experience in the room that might be very different from what the global or the theory uh, is. Um, so I don't want I, to, I, I totally understand what you're saying and, and I think uh, maybe later on in the discussion we can get back to that. But I want to uh, introduce our next speaker. So thank you so much, Leah. <laughs> Our next speaker is called uh, Fadis al uh, He's project manager, manager at the refugee company, and he's going to introduce to us that integration also has something to do with our unconscious mind. It's not only a conscious thing that we do, but our conscious mind plays a role into this whole ordeal. So please give him a warm welcome. Fadis. Thank you. I asked for a headset mic so I have my f hands free, but it's okay. <laughs> so I can just go on with my presentation? The green one. Yeah, that's what I did. Where's the green one? Good evening, everyone. Do we have still have some energy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we might not want to leave after you tomorrow. It's warm, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, before going into integration and unconscious bias, this part is inter uh, the first part of this workshop is interactive. So I need you with me. So I need your energy more than what I see now. So can I ask you all to stand up, please? Yeah. I really cannot see you. This light in my face. Okay. Can we have our hands up like this? 
Yeah, don't hit, don't hit each other. <laughs> and then slowly down. OK, a bit more slowly. Let's do it one more time. But when we have our hands up, we breathe in. And when our hands down, breathe out. OK? Like this. I'm going to talk and OK. One more time, last time, again. Better? <laughs> Thank you, you can have a seat. <laughs> okay, so I will explain about the unconscious bias by showing a slide now, and there is something written, and I would like you all to read together. Just one loud voice. OK? OK? Yes. Go on. OK. I know it's not easy. I don't know if you have, some of us have noticed that the 13 looks exactly like the B. Uh, but why do we see this? Because our brain take the whole picture. We don't focus on the details, so that's make, help us to understand or see things easier, and help us also to decide on things. This is supposed to be a video. Okay. I'm gonna show two, two pictures. This is the first one. What I need just to tell me, what's your first impression about this person? You don't have to think deeply or think out of the box. Just what do you think? What do you see? I'm going to, can I do your job? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A pet shop. That's fine. Huh? A pet shop. A pet shop, OK. Uh, let, let us talk more about the guy. Okay. What do you think about him? He has a hobby. Proud. Yeah. He has a hobby. He's proud. I think he sells birds. Yeah. He sells birds. He's keeping the birds. He breeds them. He? He breeds them. He them. Do you think he's kind? He's nice? Yeah. 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 Well, the bird is in a cage, so I don't know. Yeah, the bird is in a cage. Not so nice. You know, for, for me personally, I don't think that he's a nice guy. <laughs> because I don't know if you saw the movie, it's called The Prestige. It's, uh, it's like you, ha you make magic tricks on the stage, and one of the magics that you have to, yeah, exactly, you have to kill the bird. He doesn't have to do anything with a movie, but when I see him, I remember the movie, so I, don't, I can't see him as a nice guy. <laughs> but we saw different, like, different answers. It's all based on what we already know. One more picture, last one. Refugee in the boat. Refugee in the boat. Okay, first thing come to your mind. Lonely. Cold. Cold. Sad. Yeah, actually, this is one of the like the most answers we have about these pictures. I know the origin of this picture. This guy is uh, selling beers illegally in student housing in Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, he's, he's, he's waiting the sign from his guy to give him the beer. But why do we see it like this? A guy with a darker skin in a tent, look like a refugee camp. Media. Media. Our brain takes shortcuts for things and decides for us. We think that the, we are consciously decide on things, but actually our brain does this for us. And it's actually based on something we already know from our families, friends, education, our own experience, media mostly, culture, commercials.
but actually it's something uh, like it's an advantage for our brain. It's not something bad, and it's something it's something that we cannot stop from happening. But what we can do is be aware of it and surprise our brain. And one of the th ways to surprise our brain is to break the stereotypes. Breaking stereotypes, making more connection or communication between people. And that's what we're going to do all together now. I'm going to give you some examples, but then we're gonna, you're going to do it yourself, OK? I'm Palestinian. I don't hate Jewish people. Not all of them. <laughs> I'm from Iran. I don't eat kebab. I'm from Eritrea. I don't put spices in my food. I'm Dutch. I don't use tiki. Okay, we have three minutes. Each one of us, with the person sitting next to you, you're gonna break stereotypes you know about. It doesn't have to be about something, where, uh, uh, your country, where are you from? It could be something like, I'm tall, but I'm stuck at basketball. I don't play basketball. Something like this. Let's try all together, three minutes with the person next to you. Can we do this? Yes. Go ahead. One last minute. Okay. <laughs> Stop breaking. Thank you, thank you. Okay, quickly, let's let's share two stereotypes that you just break from two people, one interesting and one funny. Okay? Who would like to say something interesting that you heard that you just discussed? If you're not gonna raise your hands, I'm gonna pick someone. Yeah, we have one in the back. Uh, ik heb gezegd, ik ben moeder, maar ik ben nooit zwanger geweest. Ja. Uh, Juan. Sorry, my Dutch is not really good. Could you? I am a mom, but I've never been pregnant. And I've never given birth. 
that's a stereotype, right? I mean, being a mother means being pregnant. That's a stereotype. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got it. Now I got it. Yeah, yeah. It's a thinker. It's and a actually, thinker. it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, something funny? Something funny? Razan? He was like, yeah, you have pink hair, you're lesbian. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. Like, uh, people were laughing, then it's funny. <laughs> There's a lot of confusion about the word refugees. Can I say refugees? or newcomers, or states holders, it doesn't actually matter, because it's not about the name itself. It's how you deal with it, how you deal with people. I mean, the word refugee is not a bad word. It describes this group of people and their movement from their countries to their hometowns because of poverty, war, discrimination, in this short period of their lifetime. But it never describes their, their, their personalities as individuals. They had a life, long life before. They had their own experience, their own way of living, living, way of thinking, food they like to make, music they like to listen to. You can ask about their difficult period of their lifetime, but you can also ask about all these things. And they are willing to share, most of them, as much as locals. And the way how we ask or show our interest also matters. It's like, oh, you came all the way from there. Are you OK? <laughs> yeah, I'm OK. Are you OK? One of the initiatives of refugee company where I work is Cafe 5. It's located in the Azit City, the Asylum Seeker Center in Amsterdam, New West. By the way, you are welcome to come there. We have a nice coffee, cake, food, <laughs> friendly staff. So we organize activities as well there. So we had this group coming from the US, and they want to cook for the people there. You remember this, huh? Ninka is the cafe manager of Cafe 5. Uh, so one of the guys, while the people were eating, one of their uh, eating, one of their guys asked me that he want to give speech, and if I can translate into Arabic. So I said, yeah, sure, go on. He said, I know that you have a horrible life now, <laughs> and that you are so sad. So we came all the way from the US to cook for you. <sighs> I had to translate this. <laughs> of course, I didn't. I didn't say those actual words. I said, like, yeah, we are here to, happy to be here with you, enjoy our food, and Love. <laughs> I mean, this is exactly what they don't really need. This, this creates this awkwardness and distance between people. And also slow the process of integration. I'll go back to the same question. What does it actually mean, integration? To understand integration, it should be always inclusive. It's a two-way process. It's not like the Syrians or the Eritreans or the Iranians, they have to be Dutch or the other way around. We have our own identities. Look at us here. We're a group of people from different backgrounds. We should celebrate diversity here. We can learn from each other different, different perspectives which help us to grow, to understand the world better. Also to improve our cultural intelligence. Again, all by communication, I'm gonna go back to your point. One of the most important way of communication is the language. It could be Dutch, could be. It also could be English, could be Arabic, could be Farsi, Tigrinya. At least we should have one language to communicate, but it doesn't have to be always Dutch.
I don't speak Dutch until now. I lived four years in Holland. <laughs> I mean, I should, but for my personal improvement, to improve myself at work, to feel more home, to learn one extra language. One person came to me and told me, actually, it was the, uh, she was the founder of refugee company, Floor Bucker, and she told me, Faris, listen, I'm going to help you, support you to learn the language. But I will never ask you that you have to, because I'm not learning Arabic. You know, this is the mentality of, of the two-way process. It's a simple concept, think about it, but not too much. <laughs> because it could influence your personal life. I went on a date with a girl, and she she was nice, we had a good time. So I texted her the next day. Hey, um, we had a great time. Do you like to meet sometime again? I have one minute. And she replied, yes, sure, feel free to call me. <laughs> I didn't like that. Like, why I have to be the one who call you? We both had a great time. So I text her back. OK, cool. But you can also do the same and call me. Integration is a two-way process, as well as dating. <laughs> she replied, good point. <laughs> Never heard from her again. No, no. <laughs> At the end, especially for the housing projects, if you, want, if you are willing to have mixed group living together, they have to have this kind of workshops, interactive workshop, workshops about intercultural communication, about unconscious bias, about diversity, breaking stereotypes. Here's a fact about people, about us. We are afraid from the unknown. We fear from what we don't know. So what we need to do is to know. To know ourselves and each other. Thank you. Thank you so much for this beautiful session you did with us, an energetic session. Um, you also live at, uh, where, 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 which part of you live? Block, yeah. Yes. Rickerhaven. What do you think are the, the, the biggest challenges right now for uh, Startup Block? Yeah, I think it's, it's related to what, what I was talking about. Mm. Just to understand the, the, the importance of diversity, to yeah. appreciate it. Uh, to, to know how important it is to learn from each other's different perspectives and, and cultures uh, and just to deal with it as a two-way yeah. process, as I said. Yeah. I mean, it's happening for some, for some people, but I think it should be like the first step before, before all these people are getting living together. Mm. Because if you are going into this project and you already have this workshop, so you will go with more excitements. Yeah. <laughs> I think the term cultural intelligence that you named is really beautiful term also because it inst instantly values your knowledge of other cultures and 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 uh, gives you an, an, an a reason why you should uh, meet other people from other cultures exactly uh, yeah i want to open the discussion to the floor what and and bring it back to the projects themselves Bernice, you can uh, stand or sit whatever you like um the the <laughs> The projects themselves, uh, what should we uh, maintain in the projects? What can we improve? What is important when talking about integration and mixed living, community living? Yeah, sure. Because in our team of community builders, uh, we also have like a yeah, status holder. Uh, and I think by participating and by norm normalizing hi him, like he's not like at, at the equal point as we are because some things are difficult, also because of the language. But he does; he is involved with everything. So slowly, you know, he's you know doing by doing normal, he's integrating. Mm. You know, by doing the same as we do. Yeah. Uh, that's what I want to add to the. Yeah. Well, I think it's very hard to make a good community. Uh, for example, I live in Rikerhaven, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they were doing a lot of activities at the beginning, and they're still doing it. 
but it, I think it's also some sort of a personality question because it is in your personal to go outside and, and talk with people mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. So from uh, the 560 people who live at Rikerhaven, there is a community of people, uh, stakeholders and Dutch people who are there uh, a lot of times and organize a lot of stuff. But for me, it's very uh, hard uh, to make the bridge also to the people who are maybe a little bit shy and uh, have, have difficulties with come out of their house. Um, but I really like my sister's also living there and she really did her best on her whole way to do that. She always let her door open, for example, and everyone was always coming in and out and she always said, let's come hang out in the living room and that went very good. But yeah, I think <laughs> that, that, that really helps. In and, and what do you think for people that don't necessarily have the personality that's quite open and interested and, and, and what do they need to make that connection to get out there to open their doors literally yeah i mean sometimes people don't really want to so mm -hmm. that's also fine but i think they need the support of people to come out of their shelter mm -hmm. also so maybe uh like yeah drink a coffee with your neighbor like th that's really helpful i think and just take it to small groups instead of always yeah. this huge yeah, yeah. What I also found really interesting, what, what you are saying, but uh, Leia also said, is that there's a big part in integration for Dutch people as well. And of course, we have the people that live in these projects are already interested in uh, other cultures, otherwise they won't necessarily get to this project. But I feel maybe we should talk a little bit more about the responsibility for local people. How, how can we shape that? How can we shape the different um, narrative, maybe, that we have to be the ones that take the first initiative uh, uh, be interested, uh, open our doors, and not necessarily be oh, such a sad story, but really be interested in, in another human uh, and not the refugee side of things. Are there any ideas on that, how we can promote that, how we can... Yeah, in the back. Well, what I could think about also when you had the discussion about um, that a uh, group of different people is now put together and the differences are a big play a bigger role than maybe the common grounds like what you said with this st uh, st uh, st uh, st uh, study group oh, yeah, yeah. they have a common ground so maybe in order to make a new narrative we should create one by maybe uh, when applying also the Dutch people apply but also the um, status holders apply and maybe we could make the whole way is based on a common interest or a common yeah. thing that could be a, a new, the start of a new narrative together. <laughs> so that we can shift the focus yeah. from, yeah. The Any other ideas? Uh, oh, maybe it's time for a drink for everybody. <laughs> oh yeah. I, heard. I, w <laughs> I wanted to ask because we have multiple, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm a community builder at Spark Village as well, and uh, we wanted to say something about your uh, common interest uh, idea because it's actually an idea that we tried out once. Um, we have this project, it's called Super Beer. It's really corny, but it's like a buddy project. <laughs> and uh, we actually matched uh, different uh, residents based on their uh, common interest. And in our experience, um, it didn't work out that well. Like, um, people got along with really well with totally different people than their uh, original super beer so it's really interesting but sometimes i feel like um like having something in common doesn't exactly mean that you will get along it's like based on like differences sometimes and just uh yeah i'm not sure what it is based on because like our super beer project was kind of a fail yeah. but i th <laughs> i just thought it would be interesting to share that uh doesn't seem to work out that well in practice for us so far. And what kind of shared interest are we talking about? Well, it could be anything like, for example, uh, music, gardening, uh, sports, those sorts of things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if I may add to that, it's also a really, like, in a practical sense, that's really difficult because you want to do that as soon as people house in, but you don't know the people then. Yeah. So you have like we send out this questionnaire and only half of the people answered and then you try to match people based on that. But if you want to do that at the beginning of the project, 
that's really difficult because you just you don't have the information and also these people don't know each other in that way and may not even know in what sense they connect so yeah. A getting in to know each other camp yeah. beforehand. In three days. Yeah, yeah, something like this. Yeah. You do this for studying and you're with these people <laughs> for four years. So yeah. why not do it with the project where you will be oh. neighbors with people for so long? Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, yes, we had a buddy project as well at Starblock Elshagen and it failed as well. <laughs> so <laughs> no, but like for us, we, we noticed that when we organized events where people come in uh, passively so they could just show up and just sit mm -hmm. it worked and then they got some interactions and they actually liked it and they sometimes didn't say anything the whole evening but they liked it mm -hmm. so it worked and then they could have contact with other people and now you see that people are mixing with uh, who met each other in the first events wow. That's so people need some sort of freedom or mm -hmm. yeah yes they don't like some people are shy so they don't they don't want to speak or they don't want to do anything they just want to watch and to yeah. be part of something but and then there are some people who are very outgoing and then start talking to them so that works as well and, and do you know what happens when people get a task so for instance with a garden everybody gets a task and they have to work is that something that works or would you say no let them decide for themselves well they can decide if they want to work in the garden or not but we don't force them like you have to work in the garden so um but it it, it pulls people in because also there they uh, they don't really have to speak, you just have to do it, like football, it's like you don't have to speak the same language to play football. So uh, activities like that work, like that's my opinion. Can I say something or I'm sure, done tonight? <laughs> no, 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 you can, you can go ahead. Uh, like, I mean, all this body projects with, uh, with connecting to, to uh, one, like one uh, newcomer uh, with, the, with the Dutch person, I think it works if, if if you they understand that you are just getting to know each other, that's that's the the whole point of it. Mm -hmm. It's not like okay, he's the refugee, go help him. Because this this sometimes how it works. Okay, you need some help, go help him. Yeah. Just that's yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like okay, maybe he need uh, to make a CV or he want to find a job. Maybe you want to talk about music. Mm -hmm. so you can help you get a job. Exactly. Mm. This is again to the two. Way process. It's nice if there's something in common, but it's also more interesting if there's a lot of differences. Yeah. yeah. We had a question here or a comment. No, it's just an idea uh, which uh, the tenants of another project in Utrecht had. Uh, new people, new tenants coming to the project. Uh, they have. Uh, they get invited for a, a dinner every month. Every two months, there's one dinner for the new tenants, and well, that's a welcoming dinner. And two months later, they have to make the dinner for the next tenants who are coming to a welcome dinner. So they have their welcoming uh, from the, well, the existing tenants. And then two months later, they are the ones welcoming mm. the next tenants. Mm. And that's, that's one thing they have to do. They uh, can participate in everything, in sporting, uh, gardening, everything. But that's the mm. only thing they have to do in the project. And it really works, mm. because that's uh, one way to meet like a group of 10, 15 people. Mm. And that's uh, the scale which works. Mm. So we try to build communities um, on the smallest level. Mm. And that's <coughs> the whole way, I think. That's the start for the community. Yeah. And, and when you can welcome others, that means you are part of the group already. You're already part of the group. Uh, by starting with the welcoming dinner, yes. Thanks. Yes? <coughs> yeah, I just had to think about an example from Riekerhaven where we have uh, this, this one task that we have with our hallways to clean the hallway. And it's it also remind me of the composting. It's like super shitty to do, and mm. like there are plenty of people who said like, yeah, maybe we can hire someone who can clean the hallway for us. You know, we give two euros everyone each. But then I really liked about Rikerhaf that they said no because then you miss the part of doing things together and fixing things together. And yeah, I'm also a gangmaker, and for me it's a super nice way to to uh, give responsibles to everyone, and that really makes our hallway better. I think mm. a little bit. Even though it's garbage, also. Yeah. <laughs> oh. 
I want to give the people from the corporations a chance to maybe reflect on everything that they've heard because you're still starting new project project maybe there's projects that are running. Um, what have you learned? What are you what what are your insights for of tonight? Uh, my name is Peter. I work at Rochdale, which is pronounced in the English pronounced in the English way. <laughs> um, uh, and actually, when David uh, started his story, I heard that he didn't really like his time at the NDSM, uh, which was our project, our first project. And um, I'm happy to hear tonight that we actually learned a lot from it. So um, I guess. Uh, selecting on motivation uh, was a big point uh, uh, and starting together uh, at a project was really an advantage. Uh, we learned that also from uh, Ricard Hafen uh, and at NDSM we didn't select the, the student tenants because they were already living there. Um, and I was quite curious because now we were speaking about everybody is participating in integration. Uh, so I guess we're doing a good job by having the locals uh, selected because they, we think that they are like open to integrate also the other way around. Um, but I'm curious if that's enough because we're building like small villages in a city um, and I would like uh, everybody to be open for integration. And what I'm thinking, but I want to check it with the people here, um, are we doing a good job uh, integrating first at the projects and are we actually helping the status holders here to then uh, develop skills and be more equal in uh, the rest of uh, sorry, society? So uh, then maybe you learn the language at the project, you learn some basic stuff to be more equal at the, at the rest of the city or the country or whatever. It, and maybe it's a question for David and, and the others. Would you like to answer? Well, actually, for, for this case, like, do we make a village or for, for, for people who mm, this kind of a project? I, I think it's not so because, uh, as mentioned, Mohammed, like, if you live in kind of in the countryside, you, d you don't have this the same uh, uh, the same age. You don't have contact with, with people with your uh, like your, your your age. So I think uh, it's really useful for the, the first step in this age between 20 and 27. So after that period, he will, uh, yeah, he know about what won in it and how can he just himself, himself and yeah, like this. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, what I learned of this evening is that uh, maybe we have to lower our expe expectations. Um, integration is a very uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, concept. And uh, I've been a manager of uh, social housing at, uh, uh, for 10 years, and uh, good neighborship has always been uh, uh, a problem for me. How we can get uh, uh, six people live on the same stair being a good uh, neighbor. Um, uh, I've never seen that as an integration uh, project. Mm. Uh, and I, don't, I think we don't have to see it also in that way. Uh, let's start uh, uh, with uh, just uh, uh, do it um, in a very uh, uh, slowly way no, to know each other. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, you have to know each other. Uh, even if as a as a as a neighbor, you. Um, uh, well, um, so that it's more about human connection, not yeah. necessarily integration as a whole. Yeah, yeah. And maybe then it, it can develop in an in other way, yeah. and maybe a neighbor gets a buddy, and maybe uh, uh, something something else. Yeah. Yeah. So um, no difficult expectations. Yeah. Ring, do you maybe have something to add? Uh, well, first, uh, thanks for the inspiring uh, speeches from uh, for us and also from Leah. Um, because of the, the equal uh, um, uh, position of the Dutch youngsters and the, the refugees, and, and they uh, both uh, to, to integrate, the, you need uh, it from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, that was also one of our starting points uh, for Startwork uh, Rika Have the, the half of the people from uh, um, refugees uh, participating in the. Um, um, in the beheer uh, of the of Starbuck yeah. self-management, um, 
other thing uh, we uh, we learned uh, about uh, uh, Rika Haaf is um, to have smaller groups. Uh, in, in Elshagen, we have made uh, groups of uh, uh, 12 to 16 uh, people living in one uh, one hallway, yeah. and I, th I think that this one uh, is also have a better um, uh, starting point from. Uh, so not the 36 at Kasper. No, uh, we had uh, in uh, Stabroekrieg happens. You have also groups for, from uh, 30 people, and that's uh, more difficult yeah. for the integration. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Fadis, I wanted to ask you one more question that just popped into my mind. Tonight we might be here with a lot of people that are interested in, in, the, in the topic, um, but what can we say to the bigger Dutch population? What can Dutch people actually gain from the cultural intelligence that they can have when they interact with people with a migration background? So what, are, what, what can we tell them instead of don't be sad for them, you can actually gain something from them, and that's this. Yeah, I think I mentioned this, which is first let's let's go with the bigger picture. It's not it doesn't have to be something with immigrants. Mm -hmm. Like if some if a student is coming uh, from uh, Venezuela, are you gonna ask him you have to learn Dutch? It doesn't work like this. Only like <laughs> like uh, mostly the, the refugees or the migrants you have you, you ask them to learn the l the language. Uh, but it's not it's not about the migrants. It's just learning from different perspectives of people from all over the world. Mm. It's not about who was refugees or migrants. Yeah. Anyone from uh, all over the world that we can learn from each other. Yeah. So maybe the message should be: Don't go traveling after your high school. Just go live in a mixed housing uh, <laughs> project, <laughs> community living, right? Like here, like there, it's like more focused that you can yeah. really see it. You have people next door to you. Yeah. Let's make it sure. uh, like easier. Yeah. But we should should also like really appreciate if or, or understand if we have a diverse group or diverse team yeah. leading something yeah that will make always different results uh, better results thank you so much thank you thanks and thank you all for being here tonight and um discussing this amazing interesting topic of course we, we're not done discussing integration and uh, discussing these projects but we sure made a small step in the whole uh discussion about this um we can drink, we can talk more, and we can drink something uh, downstairs at the bar. Of course, look at the website of Pakhasisweg. We have many amazing events coming up. Um, and hopefully, we'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you.